Go ahead and start our talk today. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Samuel King from University of Missouri, Columbia. Uh, Professor King uh, graduated from. Uh, <laughs> because uh, it's a. Mm -hmm. Supposed to look this up before. <laughs> yeah, <job. laughs> I did. I did. I did. But, but I, it's a uh, uh, in 2006 graduate from K A I S T. Uh, it's Korean Advanced uh, Institute of Science and Technology. That's what I'm looking for. And then in 2009 got a bachelor's degree in science from Seoul National University, and then a PhD from Johns Hopkins University in 2014. He then did a postdoc at UCLA, and then in 2018, he joined the University of Missouri in Columbia as an assistant professor. Uh, his research is on condensed matter theory, and today he will talk about unconventional spintronics in quantum materials. Please join me to welcome <coughs> Professor Kim. Uh, first of all, thanks for giving me an opportunity to give a talk. Uh, at the University of Kansas. So I'm going to talk about unconventional spintronics in quantum materials. Uh, can you hear me uh, from the back? Yeah. OK. So throughout the history of physics, charge transport measurement has been a central probe of conducting materials. For example, electrical resistance provides defining characteristics of many interesting condensed matter phenomena. The best example would be superconductivity, in which electrical resistance suddenly goes to zero at sufficiently low temperatures. However, <coughs> unfortunately, charge transport measurement cannot be used for insulating materials which are abundant in nature. In particular, many of interesting quantum materials are insulators with which we cannot perform charge transport measurement. Conventional techniques to study those materials uh, either neutron scattering or optical spectroscopy. However, the absence of uh, transport measurement for insulators is changing because of newly available spin transport measurements that we have been developing in the field of spintronics. Spintronics is the field in which we are trying to use spin degrees of freedom in addition to charge degrees of freedom of electrons to overcome some fundamental obstacles that we are facing in conventional electronics. One of the, one of the most urgent issues of con conventional electronics is the significant energy loss due to Joule heating. For example, in our current coupling technology, more than half of the energy, which are colored by purple here, is being wasted without doing any meaningful calculation. So we are wasting more than half of the energy just for nothing. Spin tolerance vision of computing is based on, based, based on spin rather than charge, which provides a potential solution to this uh, energy problem of conventional electronics. Our ability to control spin has been improved uh, for the last three decades, driven by practical motivations to make faster and more reliable spintronic devices. Usually recognized the starting point of spintronics is the discovery of the uh, so-called giant magnet, magnet resistance in 1988, which allowed us to uh, read out magnetic state electrically. In 1996, uh, people found a way to not only read out, but also write in a magnetic state electrically by the so-called spin transport talk. Around 2004, it became possible to generate pure spin current without accompanying charge current uh, by the discovery of the so-called spin hole effect. So this uh, year of 2004 is important in the history of spintronics because before 2004, main material platform for spintronics has been metallic materials where we can use a charge uh, to transfer the information. However, after the 2004, Insulating materials are becoming more and more popular in spintronics because there's, there's no Joule heating. So we, uh, there's no energy loss due to Joule heating simply because there's no charge current. Instead, we transfer the 
transport and store information by using spin degrees of freedom of electrons. There are many ways to generate and detect pure spin current. The most popular method is an electrical way uh, using heavy metals such as platinum or tungsten with a strong spin optic coupling. The pattern of the physical phenomena is called the spin hole effect, which can be described as follows. So let's consider a thin film of platinum uh, lying in this plane as a concrete example. When you apply electric field in this direction, <coughs> electrons will move along the electric field. When these electrons move along the electric field, they, they experience a spin-dependent transverse force uh, by pushing up spin, colored by blue, to the right, and by pushing uh, down spin electrons to the left, uh, colored by this red, uh, red arrow. As a result, uh, with this longitudinal electric field, uh, in a transverse direction, <coughs> we don't have charge current because these two uh, electron motion cancels each other for charge current. But we have a net spin current in the transverse direction because these two spin currents add up. So by using this uh, spin hole effect, we can generate pure spin current in a transverse direction by applying a longitudinal <coughs> electric field. The null effect was experimented confirmed in 2004 in galumazanite by optical method. To detect a pure spin current, we can use an inverse spin null effect, <coughs> which refers to the uh, generation of transverse electric field by the incoming spin current. So by using inverse spin null effect, we can detect a spin current coming into the platinum by measuring the voltage development perpendicular to it. <coughs> The inverse spin null effect was experimentally confirmed in 2006 in this heterostructure made of palm alloy and platinum. Our ability to use this spin null effect and the inverse spin null effect has been uh, improving for the last decade. Now we have uh, advanced technology for spin current generation and spin current detection, which did not exist in the past. So this is totally new. Uh, for, for, first, for uh, this is totally new, which did not exist uh, like 10 years ago. Think about all the possibilities that we can do with this new technology. From the practical point of view, now we can use insulating material <coughs> as a spin, uh, as a dual heating spin transport medium by sandwiching it with a spin current source and a spin current detector. Motivated by that idea, Van Vige Group in the Netherlands performed the spin transport measurement uh, through the uh, through the Ichimayan Gane, which is the most popular magnetic insulator in spin tronics because of a small damping. So here they used this platinum as a spin current source, and they used this platinum as a spin current detector, and they measured the voltage development across this spin current detector by changing the distance between two platinum. <coughs> <coughs> to measure the spin current, uh, to, spin current uh, to measure the spin transport efficiency through the Ichiman gun. Here's the result. The horizontal axis is the distance between two platinum. It's basically the distance between spin current source and the spin current detector. The vertical axis uh, is the represent the uh, voltage development across the uh, second platinum, uh, meaning that uh, this this is basically quantifying the spin current magnitude at the uh, at the second platinum. So this figure is showing the spin current magnitude at the spin current detector uh, as a distance between these two platinum. And as you can see, there's a clear, clear exponential decay of spin current <coughs> as you go away from the spin current source. And this de exponential decay of spin current is due to the finite lifetime of spin in the solid. In solid, uh, spin is never conserved quantity, unlike the charge of electrons. Electron charge is a scalar quantity. <coughs> it has a definite value, 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 Coulomb. So it's just a scalar quantity. You cannot, uh, you cannot change it. But spin, electron spin can be uh, flipped from up direction to the down direction because it's a vector <coughs> quantity. This electron spin has always a finite lifetime. And in solid, due to, the, uh, due to the, this lattice structure, so spin lifetime is usually very short. 
So this exponential decaying of a spin current uh, was one of the clearest signatures of uh, uh, spin current decay, and which became possible only recently thanks to the advancement of these spintronic techniques. From, uh, from the fundamental science point of view, now we can study various quantum materials, even insulators, uh, by sandwiching it with the spin current source and the spin current detector via their transport properties. Many interesting questions arise in this new possibility, which was impossible in the past. For example, what kind of novel spin transport would be possible in quantum materials? What kind of new physics will arise from strong quantum fluctuations in quantum materials? I'll give a couple of uh, recent examples in this research direction. First, <coughs> superfluid-like spin transport in antiferromagnetic oxides. Last year, Wei Han Group at Peking University performed spin transport measurement uh, through one of the uh, antiferromagnetic oxides, insulating oxide, chromia, chromia, by sandwiching it with a two platinum, one as a spin current source and the other as a spin current detector. And they measured this voltage development across the spin current detector by changing the distance between the two platinum, which is in the exactly same experimental setup uh, with the previous, previous uh, setup, except for, different, using, except for using different material, chromia, which is an antiferromagnetic oxide. Here's the result. Horizontal axis is the distance between two platinum. Vertical axis uh, represents the spin current magnitude at the uh, spin current detector. <coughs> Surprisingly, spin current does not decay exponentially. It rather decays algebraically as one of a, uh, one of a distance. You don't see exponential decay here, which is uh, in stark contrast with this uh, strong suppression of spin current in Ichimayangane. Why, what's the difference between two systems? Why does chromia have algebraic decaying spin current, uh, whereas this yttrium garnet has this exponentially decaying spin current? In fact, this algebraic decaying spin current is an, is a, uh, is an evidence of the so-called superfluid-like spin transport, which was predicted to exist in certain magnetic systems, which uh, called easy plane magnetic systems. So easy plane magnetic systems have this U1 spin rotation symmetry, which, is, uh, which is, has a close analogy to this U1 phase symmetry of a superconductor. In that sense, this uh, easy plane magnetic systems can support so-called superfluid like spin transport. That's why this chromia ha can support this uh, slowly decaying spin current, uh, differing from this uh, yttrium ion garnet. And that superfluid like a spin transport? Yeah. You, you oh, yes. seem to be using this kinematic relation of the commutators mm -hmm. as uh, evidence of a superconducting uh, state. Mm -hmm. Yep. It's kinematic. It has nothing to do with the state. A kinematic. kinematic. It's just an identity. It's a math identity. Yes. There's no information in it. So it doesn't matter what the state is one way or the other. Uh, no, uh, this, this, uh, this commutation relay, yeah, we are using. This com uh, analogy between commutation relations uh, between easy plane magnets and no, superfluids. No time commutators have any physics in them. Uh, no, it has. They're just, they're just math identities. Uh, no, it has. Uh, it has a strong, uh, important consequence in physical, well, physical I systems. Can see how, I can see how you make it an analogy between two equations that look the same. But where is the connection with, hmm? uh, with the supercurrent? Super uh, yeah, that uh, that is not written here. To, uh, to make analysis to supercurrent, you need, uh, you need one, another couple of, another uh, line of commutation, not commutation relation, you need Hamiltonian in terms of order parameter, uh, phi and SG, and you need to derive equation of motion by using Is commutation there relation. For an order parameter here? Yeah, yeah, they have a very analogous order parameter. Basically, both of them uh, can be described by the complex uh, wave function, psi, yeah. So the equation of motion is uh, exactly analogous. And from there, you can drive the. You have an experimental observation of this algebraic decay one over d. Yeah. Okay, that is pretty. That is pretty extraordinary. Yeah. So much different than exponential, and it actually suggests some kind of two-dimensional geometry. Yep. Yeah. Is that what's going on? Uh, two-dimensional geometry. Yeah, I mean, if you just had an ordinary wave, mm -hmm. if, if, then the intensity goes like one over r squared. Uh, 
What's the geometry or the what's the actual mechanism by which the one over d comes out? Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, I, I left out details uh, in, this, uh, in this slide. It's just the introduction of this uh, new phenomena. Uh, I left out the theoretical details. If you're interested in, we can talk about later. Maybe okay. because of um, majority of us. It's not relevant. Uh, majority, yeah. So, but, but this kind of analogy is well established. But uh, there's, a, uh, there's a difference between charge uh, superconductor and uh, magnetic systems uh, because of this uh, charge is kind of the quantity. But spin is not a kind of the quantity, so it's, there's uh, some uh, important difference. That's why we have this uh, dissipation. Uh, it's the charge spin current is not uh, is not constant, uh, unlike <coughs> unlike from this super charge supercurrent in superconductors. Uh, but uh, but there are important analogy bit analog the important formal analogy between two systems, and uh, that that uh, that we can discuss uh, maybe after the after talk if you're interested. This superfluid like spin transport has been uh, pro was proposed by uh, this uh, Sonin in 1979, and it has been uh, studied theoretically by many uh, many theorists, including by myself. But experimental confirmation uh, came just last year because of this uh, newly available spin transport techniques. So this was the uh, one of the uh, first <laughs> experimental signatures of efficient superfluid like spin transport. Second. Spin transport in insulating quantum wave graphene. The quantum wave phase of graphene at the charge neutral point uh, is known to be an insulator, both in both in bulk and in edge. So there is no uh, charge current in in this quantum wave phase of graphene at the charge neutral point, and that that phase was conjectured to be an antiferromagnet, but without any definite experimental confirmation. Motivated by this uh, uh, the, uh, advancement of spin transport techniques. Jakubi group at Harvard and Jenny Rao's group at OSU, Ohio State University, performed the spin transport measurement through insulating graphene by sandwiching it with the spin current source and the spin current detector. So they measured the voltage development across the spin, uh, spin current detector by changing the temperature and the magnetic field. And they observed the significant spin transport across the insulating graphene. And they attributed that uh, spin current to the uh, uh, spin wave. Uh, in this quantum wave phase graphene, uh, and uh, those those two oh, sorry, so those two experimental papers were the first strong experimental evidence for antiferromagnetic phase of graphene in uh, insulating uh, insulating quantum wave phase. Here, uh, let me talk about my uh, recent research on spin transport through uh, strom strom rutinate, which is which is called SR two one four. So SR214 is a, one of the best candidate materials for the uh, so-called chiral spin triplet superconductors. But that is a still open question whether it is really a chiral spin triplet superconductor or not. If it is a really uh, chiral spin triplet superconductor, and then it can support uh, the so-called uh, it can support a special topological defect, so-called half quantum vortex, which can enable topological quantum computation that we have been looking for in quantum information science. So many people have been working on this uh, material for many years uh, to find uh, an evidence, positive or negative evidence, uh, for this spin triple superconductivity, but uh, there is no global consensus about its nature. To address open, this open question, we studied the uh, uh, superfluid transport of both the charge and spin through this uh, through the root rate by assuming uh, it's a spin triple superconductivity <coughs> in this heterostructure. So uh, our theoretical study was motivated by the experimental progress on making a heterostructure uh, made uh, consisting of this SR214, which is a superconductor, and SR0113, uh, which is known to be a ferromagnetic metal. Uh, three years ago, uh, Yoshi Mayanoji group at the University of Tokyo uh, successfully fabricated this heterostructure of SR113 and SR214 with atomically uh, smooth interface and highly conducting interface, which finally allows us to inject spin polarized current into SR214. So by motivated by, uh, by, motivated, uh, motivated by that experimental progress, 
Uh, we used this uh, spectral structure consisting of SLO214 <coughs> and two SLO113 as two magnetic leads. And we studied the uh, dependence of charge current and spin current on the relative orientation of these two magnetizations. One of the most important results of this research is that uh, spin transport measurement through this spectral structure can prove or disprove the conjectured spin triple superconductivity of SLO214. So uh, Taiwan Nose Group at uh, Seoul National University is working on its experimental realization. Currently, uh, by going beyond the, uh, this zero temperature physics of SLO214, uh, now we are looking for the possibility of uh, exotic 4E superconductivity in SLO214 at finite temperature. So at, S at zero temperature, SRO214, if it is a really spin triple superconductor, uh, it supports both the charge order and the spin order, implying that uh, this material can support both the charge supercurrent and spin supercurrent. So in terms of so-called Cooper pairs, uh, we have uh, spin up Cooper pairs and spin down Cooper pairs at zero temperature, and they can move freely without interfering with each other so that the system can support uh, independent charge per current and uh, speech per current. However, as we crank up the temperature, one of these two orders will be destroyed before the other, right? Because of different uh, stiffness, uh, stiffness of these two orders. And recently, we, uh, we recognize that probably uh, spin order will be destroyed before the charge order because of, the, uh, uh, because of this um, weak uh, interactions. If spin order is destroyed before the charge order, above TC, SRO214 can support charge supercurrent, but it cannot support the spin supercurrent. In terms of Cooper pairs, these two, these two Cooper pairs, spin up Cooper pairs and spin down Cooper pairs, cannot move freely. If they move freely, then they, they should be able to support the spin supercurrent. In terms of Cooper pairs, absence of spin order dictates that spin up Cooper pairs and spin down Cooper pairs should be paired up again and should move together in the same direction so that spin current is zero. So elementary electric charge of elementary excitation in this phase uh, should be four times of electron charge, which is the reason why this superconductivity is called the 4E superconductivity. In fact, this uh, four-way superconductivity was proposed, uh, proposed by uh, Fredkin and Kibelson uh, in this uh, certain types of high temperature superconductors with a pair density wave. But uh, there was no experimental confirmation yet. And we believe that uh, SRO214 can, be uh, can be an alternative platform to look for this exotic four-way superconductivity. And we are working on this manuscript currently. So graphene and superconductors are just two examples of quantum materials. Uh, quantum materials are material systems that can manifest quantum effects over a wide range of energy and length scales, which include various types of superconductors, two-dimensional materials like graphene, transition metal dichalcogenides, topological insulators, and quantum spin liquids, and so on and so forth. The current global interest in science is focused on quantum material science as can be seen in this National Quantum Initiative Act signed by the president last year, and also in this uh, quantum flagship announced by EU, together which, uh, together which will, uh, will spend more than $2 billion over uh, 10 years. Currently, we are witnessing the uh, marriage of two huge fields of spintronics and the quantum materials. Spintronics is the practical field for the last three decades, we have been developing uh, various techniques to control and detect spin, driven by practical motivations to make better spin throwing devices. Now we can use those techniques to study quantum materials. In particular, uh, many of quantum materials have, uh, many of these interesting properties of quantum materials are uh, described by the abstract mathematical concepts such as topology, entanglement, and frustration. And it would be a very interesting direction to see how these abstract concepts will manifest in this uh, new, newly available spin transport measurement through quantum materials. By, 
Uh, also, many quantum materials are known to have a strong, strong interactions between degrees of freedom, charge, spin, and lattice. And uh, this spintronic proof will give a valuable information about those, inter those uh, in interesting interactions. By turning the table around, quantum materials will provide new functionalities for, uh, for, new, uh, for spintronics uh, that we cannot find in conventional materials. So in the remaining time, I'll give one example for each direction by, uh, by using my uh, recent research uh, result. And the synergetic development between spintronics and quantum materials will be backed up by a global interest in quantum information science. First, spintronic probe of two-dimensional magnetism. Two years ago, Shadong uh, Suzhou Group at the University of Washington reported the first discovery of two-dimensional uh, monolayer, two-dimensional material with uh, intrinsic magnetism, uh, chrome-3 iodide, which turned out to be a honeycomb ferromagnet where chrome el uh, where magnetic elements form a honeycomb lattice. This report of uh, uh, first discovery of a single-layer two-dimensional quantum magnet excited a lot of researchers in particular those working on spintronics because of, uh, because of their potential utility for atomic collecting devices. And many people are now working on this two-dimensional magnetism because of fundamental interest as well as uh, their practical utilization. So that uh, honeycomb ferromagnet, uh, intrinsic two-dimensional honeycomb ferromagnet was experimentally discovered in 2017 Interestingly, one year before that year, one year before, uh, before we, studied, uh, we studied this excitation, topological excitation of this honeycomb ferromagnet in 2016. So at that time, there was no intrinsic natural two-dimensional honeycomb ferromagnet. So we proposed to use artificial version of it, uh, which, was built by, uh, which can be built by depositing magnetic other atoms on silicon on a honeycomb lattice, like here. So red dots uh, represent the magnetic other atoms, and they are arranged by honeycomb lattice. And uh, this silicon is uh, non-magnetic. And these, uh, these magnetic other atoms interact with each other by, LK, uh, by, the, um, by this, uh, some kind of interaction in silicon. So by dictating the symmetry of this honeycomb lattice, we can write down the effective, uh, effective Hamiltonian for spins. Here. So here this uh, SI is the uh, localized spin uh, represented by this red dot here. And it is localized at site, at certain site. And uh, each term represents the uh, certain interaction of these spins. And this, uh, this Hamiltonian is completely dictated by the symmetry of a honeycomb lattice. So this uh, natural two-dimensional honeycomb ferromagnet has the Hamiltonian of the exactly same form. So uh, this uh, result, uh, our result uh, coming from this Hamiltonian can be equally applied to the artificial, artificial honeycomb ferromagnet, also a natural honeycomb ferromagnet. So this first term is called the uh, ferromagnetic exchange interaction. So with the positive J, a neighboring spins wants to be in the parallel direction. So the ground state of the honeycomb ferromagnet uh, has this kind of uniform spin configuration. The second term is the uh, ne near, uh, next nearest interaction uh, coming from spin orbit coupling that is called the uh, so-called jaloshinsky moria interaction. The, the next last term is the uh, G-man coupling between uh, spin and the external magnetic field. So in a ground state, all the spins uh, point in the same direction because of the ferromagnetic exchange interaction. So elementary excitation from, from that ground state is this uh, so-called spin wave which is, which is shown by this animation. By quantizing this spin wave, we can get a quartz particle uh, for that excitation, which is called a magnon. And the magnon is a boson, so it carries a spin H bar uh, in the opposite direction to this uh, spin direction of a ground state. So to uh, study ex excitations of this uh, honeycomb ferromagnet, we calculated the magnum band structure based on the Hamiltonian with this geometry. Uh, so we have this periodic direction in the x direction. And we considered about 20, uh, 20 uh, sites 
along the y direction. So this, re this yellow box represents the uh, unit cell for our calculation. And we calculated the uh, so-called background band structure with this geometry. And here's the result. So th this horizontal axis is the uh, kx uh, momentum in the x direction. This vertical axis represents the energy. As you can see, we have uh, this. Oh, sorry. We have this uh, clearly. We have upper band and lower band, and there are two uh, separate modes connecting these two, uh, these two, uh, these two upper and lower bands. And in fact, this uh, this uh, linear mode corresponds to the edge mode localized along the bottom of the uh, strip. And from the uh, slope, we can see that this edge mode only uh, moves only to the right. So this edge mode always moves to the right. Uh, there is no uh, there is no motion to the uh, to the left. And this line corresponds to the edge mode localized along the top of the strip, and it always moves to the left. So why do we have this kind of uh, edge mode localized along the uh, top and the bottom part of the strip? Why do we have those kind of special uh, strange edge mode? We can understand the origin of this existence of edge mode by considering uh, topological property of bulk bands, which are characterized in terms of so-called Berry curvature. Uh, Berry curvature is the uh, is a quantity defined by the uh, background wave function u here, and then uh, uh, this uh, this figure sh is showing the Berry curvature for upper band and lower band. As you can see, upper band has this uh, hot positive Berry curvature everywhere in the uh, in the momentum space. When we integrate this Berry curvature over the uh, whole momentum space, it gives one, which is called the Chan number. <coughs> when we integrate Berry curvature for the lower band, it is it is minus one. And this, these chart numbers are special because uh, there is a so-called bulk boundary correspondence, uh, saying that if neighboring bands have different chart numbers, there must be edge mode connecting these two uh, bulk bands. So this bulk boundary correspondence is saying that we should have this kind of uh, edge mode with a definite, uh, with a definite directions uh, due to these chart numbers of uh, bulk bands uh, of magnets. So due to this result, uh, we identified the, identified the Hanikoff ferromagnet as one of the first magnonic topological insulators as a magnonic counterpart of electronic topological insulators. In fact, uh, this, uh, in fact this system uh, can be formally mapped to uh, the uh, Haldane's topological insulator, uh, which Haldane studied uh, in, uh, in 1988. And this bulk band structure was experimentally confirmed by neutron scattering uh, by Peng Chang Dai's group at Rice University. So here you can see bulk band and the uh, row band, and there's a clear gap between these two bands. So we have this experimental confirmation of these bulk bands, but uh, unfortunately, neutron scattering does not tell us anything about Berry curvature. Neutron scattering uh, just gives us these uh, bulk bands, but it cannot show us this edge mode. Also, it cannot show us this uh, Berry curvature. How do we prove this existence of a Berry curvature? We can see it by performing transport measurement. Chrome 3 iodide is an insulator, so we cannot uh, perform charge transport measurement. Instead, we can uh, perform spin transport measurement. When we apply temperature gradient in this direction, Magnons will flow from hot region to colder region by thermal diffusion. If there is a finite Berry curvature, magnons will experience uh, transverse force due to the thermal Hall effect generating a transverse spin current, which we can detect by using this uh, spin current detector. So this generation of uh, transverse spin current by a longitudinal temperature gradient is called the spin Lorentz effect. And that is quantified, quantified by the spin Lorentz conductivity, which is the ratio of the uh, generated spin current to the applied temperature gradient. If there is a finite Berry curvature, spin Lorentz conductivity will be finite. So we, ca we calculate the uh, spin Lorentz conductivity as a function of temperature at various magnetic fields. And, uh, uh, and uh, this observation 
of a finite spin donor's conductivity will be will be a proof of a finite Betty curvature of magnets. But why exactly is there no other option? Why is that conclusive that you're seeing a Betty curvature rather than some other condensed matter effect? Mm, mm, that's, true. <laughs> that's a good question. Uh, mm. So, uh, so this magnet, so magnets are, uh, let's see, so some, some excitations, some quartz particles that can carry spin current are mag only magnets for, uh, at, let's see, are only magnets because there are no, uh, do, there's no other degrees of freedom. Phonons, there are phonon degrees of freedom also, but phonons do not, uh, are not expected to have uh, this kind of uh, noise effect. I suppose they're <laughs> I'm not aware of any explanation for that, except uh, for ours. If there is, I would be happy to learn about it. Yeah. That, that question can be asked to uh, many, interest, many all of the uh, physical phenomena. For example, quantum wave effect, you see this quantized conductance. How do you prove that comes from electron wave function? Is that only source? It's like a, it's like a negative uh, pro probability, unless uh, unless you can prove there is nothing, there is uh, something else that can contribute to that. Uh, so far, only expl explanation for that physical phenomenon is this, but uh, it's open to many other explanations that we don't know yet. But that can be asked to all the all the physical phenomena, I believe. Yeah. So I find that you mean it's not exponentially. Okay. You should be yeah. So we, so we calculate the number. We we pro, we propose some number, uh, physical number. So uh, some num some observations of uh, spin noise conductivity close to those uh, predicted numbers uh, can uh, can be a proof of a finite Betty curvature. So we in the in the paper we have some real numbers like uh, with some units. That, uh, that, and that's, uh, that's within the experimental uh, reach, current experimental reach. So it shouldn't be sm very small. So it should be observable. And this is spin noise conductivity, it should be observable to, to say. So can you, yeah, maybe, can you ask no, your question? You know what is finite? What is finite? Yeah, yeah, finite? yeah, that's right, yeah, that's right. Uh, so uh, let me see. Yeah, finite means it's yeah. Finite is not a uh, it's not exact. It's not a good. Uh, it's not a quantitative uh, adjective. So we uh, in paper we uh, proposed we estimated some numbers, uh, and then uh, let's see. I think it's okay. <laughs> yeah, finite. Yeah, finite is not a quantitative adjective, right? There's no estimation. Uh, so observations of some uh, spin noise conductivity close to uh, our prediction will serve as uh, evidence for our theory. Yeah, yeah. The, let's say, let's say like that. Okay. Okay. Ah. Oh, ah. Yeah. I'm oh, sorry. And lastly, uh, so even spin noise conductivity. Uh, cannot show the existence of edge mode. Because this edge mode uh, is supposed to be uh, localized along the edge with a fixed chirality. And this, this is spin transport cannot uh, show an evidence for that edge mode. Neutron scattering cannot tell us about edge mode. Uh, DC spin transport cannot tell us about edge mode. Instead, AC spin transport at the uh, fixed frequency can, uh, can show us this topological edge mode. 
so uh, Peng Yanzhou Group at the, in China performed this micromagnet simulation with the honeycomb ferromagnet. So they excited this uh, spin at the edge uh, with the frequency between this topological gap. And they, uh, uh, they saw this, uh, they uh, studied how that excitation propagates through the magnetic insulator. So three things are notable. First of all, uh, excitation. Uh, uh, ex the excitation propagates are only along the edge without penetrating into the bulk. Secondly, propagation only goes only to the left without going to the right. So there is a definite chirality of this propagation. Thirdly, here uh, you can see uh, this geometrical defect here and here. And they made this geometrical defect on purpose to see, to show, uh, to show that this edge mode does not scatter back. So usually, uh, uh, usually if there is no uh, special property, propag if propagation meets this kind of uh, uh, geometrical defect, there must be a backward scattering, like, uh, like in this direction. But because of this fixed chirality of edge mode, propagation uh, go around this geometrical defect and, uh, and propagate along the edge. So AC spin transport at the fixed frequency between the topological gap uh, can show us this existence of edge mode. But uh, this experiment is uh, it's kind of hard to do because you need, you need to be able to see these excitations uh, with a good special resolution over the, over the edge. And also you need to be able to excite this uh, spin uh, precisely between the gap, which could be, which might be small. So it's kind of experimentally challenging, but in principle, uh, it's possible. Uh, this honeycomb ferromagnet is just one example of magnonic topological insulators. And probably this magnonic topological insulators is one of the hottest topics in spintronics. <coughs> And there are many other materials that can uh, support this kind of uh, topological edge mode. For example, in this uh, recent paper, we showed that scumian crystal, so-called scumian crystal phase of uh, such a magnet uh, can, be, uh, can be classified as a magnonic topological insulator. Oops. And then uh, recently, uh, we have been working on uh, topological property of uh, magnon phonon hybridization in certain magnets with magnetoelastic coupling. So, oops, oops. And then uh, in the opposite direction uh, for uh, quantum materials providing new functionalities for spintronics, uh, we are going to talk about protected spin transport via a vortex liquid in superconductors. Spintronics uh, vision of computing is based on spin. So it is a very important achieve efficient spin transport with, little, uh, with as little dissipation as possible. However, spin is not a conjugate quantity, which was why we saw this exponential decaying or algebraic decaying spin current in, um, in most magnetic systems. Can it transport spin information without any loss? So to attack that question, uh, we focused on superconductors as a spin transport medium. So superconductivity refers to the ability of certain materials uh, that can support dissipation is charge transport at sufficiently low temperatures. The other parameter of the superconductivity is this macroscopic quantum wave function psi, which we learned in uh, underage quantum mechanics, this wave function which is characterized by the magnitude and the uh, phase phi. That's the order parameter for the superconductivity. And superconductivity can be destroyed by increasing the temperature or by applying a magnetic field via the proliferation of a topological defect, so-called vortices, which are shown as black dots uh, on this AFM image of a niobium selenide. Why, why are they so ordered? I thought the vortices do the vortices have to be ordered like that? Uh, in, in, certain, in, uh, in, certain, in certain situation, yeah, because of repulsion between vortices, they form usually triangular lattice. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, but there are some phases with uh, not nine crystal structure that's called uh, vortex liquid. That in that phase, vortices can move freely without forming any crystal. 
And these, these vortices are bad for superconductivity because when, these vo when a single vortex move in this direction, uh, they create final resistance in a transverse direction by unwinding the wave function phase phi uh, in the opposite direction uh, in both sides. So vortices are bad for superconductivity. And people have been uh, really hard to try to remove. People have been uh, trying, trying hard to remove these vortices from superconductors <coughs> to optimize them. But unfortunately, it is really hard to remove vortices once they are created, because they are so-called topological defects. Also, a vortex, uh, shown as black dot here, corresponds to a, a spiraling configuration of the wave function phase phi. So here, each arrow represents the wave function phase phi at each location. And when you circle around this vortex core, uh, wave function phase phi changes from 0 to 2 pi, circling the, uh, circling the origin of the complex plane one time, like this. In other words, uh, winding number of this uh, vortex is 1. And this winding number is always integer. Uh, so uh, winding number cannot change continuously because integers cannot change continuously. There's no number, there's no integer between 1 and 0. For that discreteness of a winding number, vortex with winding number 1 cannot be removed by continuous deformation of this configuration. In that sense, a vortex is a topological defect. And that is the reason why it is difficult to remove. Uh, so vortices are bad, but hard to remove. So our idea was, to, was this. If vortices are that hard to remove, why don't we use them for something good? So in this paper, now we proposed an idea to, uh, to, to transport the spin by using vortex. So we, uh, specifically, we showed that uh, we can interconvert between spin and vortex at the interface between magnets and the superconductors. And that idea of interconversion between spin and vortex was new. So uh, it, uh, re it, it, it has been receiving uh, some attention uh, of community. So it, that's why it was highlighted in this physics uh, magazine. And also, it was highlighted in this uh, specialized magazine for superconductors. <coughs> So here's an illustration how spin can be transported by vortex liquid. So when the left magnet uh, is dynamic, it pumps the spin into the neighboring materials. So it will pump, this dynamic magnet will pump spin to neighboring superconductor by, uh, by so-called spin pumping. And we showed that that spin can be interconverted into superconducting vortex at the interface. And those vortices can, uh, can diffu uh, will diffuse through the superconductors by thermal diffusion, and they will reach the right magnet. And also, in, in this paper, we show that this vortex can be interconverted into spin in the right magnet. So in this way, spin can be uh, transported from the left magnet to the right magnet by a vortex liquid in superconductors. I would like to emphasize that uh, in this proposal, in this uh, spin transport, we don't lose any spin information in the bulk, in the bulk of a superconductor because of a topological protection of vortex. Yeah. So vortices are good for spin transport according to this, uh, according to this theory. So probably the best material for this proposal would be uh, high TC superconductors with a vortex liquid phase uh, as shown in this uh, a black, uh, brown, uh, blue area in this phase diagram. <coughs> okay, maybe I have to skip. Uh, so maybe I have to skip this one. It's too detailed. So let, yeah, this. So uh, maybe yeah, let me let me talk about this um, one of the microscopic process for this uh, spin to vortex conversion, which uh, which is kind of interesting. So when the uh, so this. Uh, to understand this spin vortex transmutation, it is important to recognize the importance of this interfacial area uh, denoted by SH here. So SH stands for spin hole. Uh, so this interfacial area is just subject to spin-over coupling because of the uh, because of so-called mirror symmetry breaking. 
So there will be coupling between uh, charge, and, uh, charge and spin in this area. That will allow us to uh, connect spin of a magnet to a vortex in a superconductor in this mechanism. So when the left magnet is dynamic, it will uh, either generate a charge current in the spin hole region by the so-called inverse <coughs> spin hole effect. And that induced charge current will pump vortices into superconductors uh, by performing the so-called Lorentz force on those superconductors. So this, that two-step process can be described by this single equation, uh, where and that, is, uh, and that represents the dynamics of a magnet, and W is the work done by the Lorentz force on superconducting vortex. Uh, we have a similar analogous uh, picture for the vortex to spin the conversion. Okay, let me skip this part. And uh, we can prove this proposal experimentally by uh, performing FMR, so-called ferromagnetic resonance uh, measurement, FMR measurement. Mm -hmm. For the spin to vortex at the conversion, uh, uh, shine, uh, shine the microwave on the left magnet, uh, which will in turn excite the left magnet, and measure the voltage development across the uh, superconductor, <laughs> which will be proportional to the induced vortex current. So uh, by performing FMR, uh, by performing FMR, uh, by by measuring this transverse voltage development uh, upon the FMR on left magnet, uh, we'll, uh, we'll, uh, can prove uh, our <coughs> spin to vortex interconversion scenario. And also the vortex to spin to conversion, apply a charge current to a superconductor, that will generate a vortex current perpendicular to it. And then uh, uh, performing FMR measurement on the left magnet uh, will, uh, will, will allow us to prove uh, theoretical protection. And uh, Roberto Myers at Ohio State University and Jose Maria at, in Spain are independently working on ex experimental realization. So uh, let, me, let me summarize these two examples by emphasizing the importance of the topology in transport, tra transport phenomena. So in the first example, we saw that momentum space topology characterized by the very curvature uh, give rise to the robust localized transport channels. Also, in the second example, we saw that real space topology detect, uh, given rise to the topological protection of vortices uh, allows to have uh, robust information carriers for spin. These two examples show uh, my central research theme of my, uh, my group, topological transporter phenomena. So uh, the recent marriage of two, uh, two huge fields of spintronics and quantum materials are opening a new area uh, called quantum spintronics. For the fundamental science, spin charge heat transport through quantum materials uh, will give rise to new physics associated with uh, topo novel topological phases, frustration, and intertwined orders of quantum materials. Also. Spin charge heat transport through quantum materials will provide emerging functionalities that we cannot find with uh, conventional materials, such as robust spin transport, scattering free edge mode, or quantum, quantum computing. Uh, so this is my research vision, where um, I will use topology as a universal uh, theme to study various transport phenomena in quantum materials, quantum materials that can be characterized by topology in momentum space, real space, and space-time. So before concluding the talk, I would like to acknowledge uh, my collaborators, uh, both the theory and the experiment. Thank you for your attention. So you, you, you talked about this transport of spin by a vortex current. Yeah. But I thought you, but you, does a vortex current also produce heat? Because you're saying that electrical current produces heat, which is bad. Does this vortex current also produce heat? Vortex current will, pro, yeah, induce heat. There will, be dissipa there will be dissipation due to uh, heat generation. But that's not, uh, so there will be dissipation, energy dissipation. Yeah, there, but there will be no uh, spin dissipation. Okay. But there will be energy dissipation due to vortex motion. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Same follow up on that. You said initially 
that, so you cannot see it. <laughs> that the vortices are bad for the uh, superconductivity. Yep. So how do you maintain superconductivity while you are using vortices to transport your spin? So yes, that's a good question. So uh, superconductivity will be gone when vortices move. So yeah, we need to be, so there is a special temperature called uh, costal uh, temperature, KT temperature. So it's like, uh, so, we, we, so we don't have a long range order superconductivity, uh, but we will have short range order superconductivity. So it's like, uh, mm, it's like it, that, yeah, we don't have a long range order superconductivity, but we will have quasi long range order uh, it's not even quasi long range. So anyway, we will have a short range order superconductivity. So this uh, wave function will be coherent over a very uh, sm uh, over a small uh, s over small area. Yeah. Uh, but Cooper pairs can be uh, these Cooper pairs, uh, which constitute superconductors. Will uh, uh, we need Cooper pairs? But there will be no phase coherence due to vortices. So, uh, so basically this. So uh, when we learn uh, superconductors in condensed matter class, uh, we learned about this uh, TC, right? Uh, TC, uh, this basically this uh, BCS, according to BCS theory, uh, we have this mean field critical temperature for superconductors. That's where uh, Cooper pairs form. So below this TBCS, we have well-defined Cooper pairs. That's for the bulk, bulk picture. Let's see. Uh, 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 it's for the bulk picture, but uh, if voltage, if superconductors are very very thin, uh, then there is another uh, critical temperature uh, called this BKT uh, temperature. That's a Belazinski Kostolich Douglas transition temperature. So uh, we have a Cooper pairs below uh, this uh, mean field uh, critical temperature, but we don't have a phase coherence. Uh, between these two temperatures, meaning that if we take average of a wave function over whole space, it's zero because of this uh, because of this uh, phase how should I? because of this random fluctuation of phase phi. Although we have this uh, finite magnitude everywhere due to the existence of Cooper pairs, we have a finite magnitude of Cooper pairs psi. But because of this random fluctuations of phase phi, special average of this wave function is zero. Above TBK, above this uh, BKT uh, temperature. But below, so here in this region, vortices move. Vortices are free. And there are a lot of vortices. Vortices move. And there are a lot of, lots of vortices move. Lots of vortices move. But below, uh, below this BKT uh, transition, uh, vortex, vortex and anti-vortexes are uh, uh, forming a pair. So they don't move freely. They always form this kind of a pair. So here, uh, oh, sorry. Oops. Here they have uh, uh, this psi can be, uh, can be finite. Because uh, because of this, uh, because vortices cannot move freely. So in this proposal, of uh, spin transport as a, by a vortex liquid, we are using this region where vortices move freely. But this spin transport will be exponentially decaying in this region. Uh, but so if we if we measure spin transport, uh, spin current in that heterostructure, let's say spin current. So it will be exponentially suppressed, and there'll be finite, and then it will go again. Oops! It will go again like this. This spin current will be proportional to uh, free gas of vortices. So yeah, there are a lot of physics uh, in this proposal, which are really fascinating. Yeah, thank you. Okay, any questions? If that's not the case, let's thank our speaker again.